a very good morning to everyone. A very good morning to everyone. Um, and a very good morning indeed to uh, the people joining us in Zoom uh, through the webinar mechanism. Uh, and fantastic to see people here in the room this morning at the Brussels Press Club. So my name is Marat Terterov. Um, I'm the uh, representative here of the Brussels Energy Club together with uh, my colleague Nadezhda Kokotovic, who's in the audience. Uh, we have, I just want to announce uh, a big, what I would call a double header of summer meetings sort of coming up here at the Brussels Press Club uh, before people break off for the summer. We have a, a really, I think, interesting uh, event today, uh, a book launch, which in essence will be a, a seminar discussion uh, on this game changing event in many ways in terms of EU uh, Britain relations and the wider landscape, so Brexit. Um, very few people actually discuss uh, the uh, idea or the impact, one can actually say, of Brexit on the energy landscape uh, and the energy relationship uh, between the EU and the United Kingdom. Um, and when Anna Stanich informed me that uh, that she actually edited a book on this topic, I thought, wow, Anna, I'm really intrigued. And I became even more intrigued when uh, I noticed Ukraine uh, in the title of the event. Uh, so I think we're going to really have an intriguing sort of discussion uh, about, about the substance of this book, about the topics uh, involved. And of course, you can uh, see them on the uh, web program. Uh, so I just wanted to very briefly uh, introduce this event. Tomorrow, of course, we have a, a quite a substantial conference on uh, clean and conventional energy in Central Asia. Uh, so some of you may have already registered for that, and I certainly encourage you to uh, participate in that. Uh, but for today's session, uh, we have three, uh, I think, you know, really well qualified sort of people to address the topic of Brexit and uh, energy law, Brexit and EU energy relations uh, in the wider context. Uh, the authors, uh, author editors of the book are, of course, Silky Goldberg and Anna Stanich. Anna is uh, also a member of the Brussels Energy Club Advisory Board. So we're really uh, very glad to welcome both uh, you here today, Anna and Silky. And uh, indeed, I'm also very glad to see my old friend and, uh, you know, director, former director general. I think we won't use the word former in many ways, Philip, we were discussing, but uh, we can we can debate that. But Philip Lowe, uh, long, long term servant uh, of the European Commission from across the uh, La Manche on the other side uh, in the White Albion back with us here in Brussels today. It's fantastic to see Philip. Philip is, uh, I think, one of the most experienced peoples, experienced individuals on either side of the uh, of the channel. Note I didn't say English, I just said a channel. Uh, but one of the most experienced people on either side of the channel in terms of uh, the uh, European institutions, the relationship between the United Kingdom uh, and uh, the European Union. And Philip has uh, illustrious career. He actually started uh, working with the European Commission back in the 1970s, I believe, Philip. And I recall first meeting you in uh, March 2010, I believe it was, uh, when you were Director General of the Directorate General for Energy of the European Commission. I think you were previously to that uh, Director General for Competition. Uh, so your experience is, uh, I think, highly esteemed and uh, really well well placed in terms of today's uh, discussions. Philip Lowe, Sir Philip Lowe, I should say, is uh, your moderator for today's session, everybody. Uh, so Philip, I, uh, without further ado, hand the floor over, floor over to you and look forward to a really lively and fascinating session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Marit, for that uh, too flattering uh, introduction. Uh, I, I think there are one or two things you can read into the title of this event, uh, including Ukraine. But I would think there are two subtitles to it. One is um, Brexit and Energy Unfinished Business. <laughs> 
And secondly, uh, in relation to two ships which are now at sea on the on the uh, waves of energy crises one after another, uh, uh, where are they going to and are they in parallel or diverging? Now, um, I'm very happy to be flanked uh, by possibly two uh, of the most expert people on this subject, partly because they straddle the channel. Uh, um, Sidka and Anna in London most of the time. I happen to be here in Brussels most of the time now, which is um, uh, rather ironic. Um, but um, they are going to lead us through the discussion initially. I, I think, I mean, all of you know the, 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 the story in terms of the political background to this. I mean, we had um, um, a very uh, fractious period of uh, relationships between the EU and the UK during the after the Brexit referendum, um, with um, an emphasis uh, on the UK side on uh, institutional independence and uh, uh, autonomy, if you remember rightly, um, getting back control. Uh, that went rather far in terms of its uh, political implications than what we'd imagined. Um, uh, it's a bit like uh, listening to Kerensky about the form of the Russian Revolution now. Um, it, it was only after the Bolsheviks came in that we really realized what they were talking about. Um, and for a certain number of those in charge in, in, in the UK government uh, over the years, uh, the emphasis has been very much on institutional independence and autonomy and the issues or issue of pragmatic progress towards objectives which arguably both people in the European Union but also those in the UK would be interested in obtaining in attaining. So we we have that background to the the trade and cooperation agreement which was finally signed and sealed, um, followed by a transition period, and with the promise uh, in certain instances of subsequent agreements in the in the Europe in the energy area, we certainly have an agreement with respect to Euratom. Where, it, but uh, on the other hand, given that both the EU and the, the UK are co-signatories of the conventions um, on international use of atomic energy, uh, it's not surprising that there was some degree of convergence on that because they're the same rules. Um, there are other areas where one would expect cooperation to take place. Uh, given this uh, emphasis on institutional independence, um, the relationships between uh, energy bodies in the UK, whether on infrastructure on, or on uh, use of, um, of, uh, of uh, convergence on things like network codes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we haven't got very far since uh, the original decisions to, um, to, uh, uh, to move in, in, in a direction which was to to set sail differently on different courses. Now, there are some areas where one, one would expect the UK and the EU to remain on convergent courses, but at least parallel in relation to um, carbon uh, climate change objectives and in relation to some degree of um, of uh, consensus on the need for competitive energy markets. However, we, we've yet to see that um, uh, emerging. There are some areas such as uh, on 
the use of uh, storage and use of CO2 and on hydrogen, one, one would expect that the, the UK would want to encourage the EU to go in the same direction as itself and vice versa. <laughs> Uh, but um, so far, we don't have uh, a great deal of, um, uh, of detail on that. Um, we have, of course, a, a promise by the UK government to, um, to let certain laws of the European Union fall uh, completely from the, the UK statute back book by the end of the year. And all we have so far is an indication that... Uh, there won't be a complete uh, sunset clause and everything that they will list the things which they will actually um, uh, uh, let expire. I, I've given you some of the background to this discussion. I, the, the book, which has been uh, prepared by Zilka and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, Rana as, as co-editors, uh, really is um, is topical in my view because it re represents exactly the position which we were we're in now. Even though it was prepared last year with a lot of contributions, including contributions from Eric and, and Fabian, uh, who are in the audience today. Um, uh, I think this book is a, a tremendous um, uh, provides us a tremendous. Uh, checklist of things which we need to look at and to if in the interests of doing of the uk and the eu doing more together and if it can, it does not want if they don't want to do more together then at least uh the, they know what they're missing by not doing it um, there is a discussion as well on the issue of uh uh, uh uk membership of uh, or, or participation in the horizon program and it's and it's and the follow-up to it here again we'll see what's what what will eventually happen uh the windsor agreement gave the impression that uh the uk was prepared nevertheless to look pragmatically at things but um uh that was a an in statement of intention in many areas and not a, actually not followed up by any kind of reality so i I'll stop speculating about these two ships leaving port together and uh, ask my uh, colleagues to uh, to begin the discussion. Zika, as you know, is is a partner in Herbert Smith Freehills in London. Uh, Herbert Smith Freehills has a has a thriving and uh, very successful uh, energy. Um, uh, energy sector inside it, no doubt, primarily due to Circa herself, but there are others involved as well. <laughs> not just in not just in London, <laughs> and Anna uh, in uh, in um, in uh, ENA Law. Well, she's she is an ENA Law to a certain extent, um, but um, uh, her her reputation is goes wider than that. Uh, both academically and 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 uh, away from the UK. So um, I'm not sure who would like, Anna, would you like to start first or? Maybe just uh, just a bit more by way of where this sort of energy sits within the TCA and then maybe Silk yeah. will take it from there. I think what Philip has um, has sort of um, outlined is, is, is very important to understand that energy was sort of an afterthought as part of the negotiations for Brexit. So if you look at the 1,200 page document, the TCA, um, energy is 12 pages. <laughs> and so, you know, it it's really not something that has, you know, that much attention was given to. And yet, obviously, crucially, um, now, as a result of both the sort of goals of climate change decarbonization, but also the issue of energy security as a result of the war in Ukraine and, and the sanctions. Uh, clearly, energy is an incredibly important um, issue. Um, and there are two things which I think also were mentioned by Philip that are really important to understand that the, the TCA um, 
doesn't envisage, unlike other free trade agreements, it doesn't envisage any sort of regulatory alignment. It actually has the opposite um, provision. It's con it actually says what should happen when there is no regulatory alignment. So it envisages that the two ships will sail in different directions and then provides for mechanisms of what can be done in order to, for those ships to sort of be realigned, but primarily as a result of countermeasures. So not as a result of any kind of an alignment. So in with respect to energy, there are these kind of provisions that say they should be, they should aim to co collaborate, cooperate. Um, but again, there's no hard and fast rule. There's an, in, an attempt or in, there's um, an idea that there would be, um, uh, that the two sides would try to reach an agreement and that there would be a future agreement on these matters, whether it's renewables, cooperation in the North Sea. But at this point in time, the best we have is, for example, with respect to the North Seas, that we have a forum to discuss best practices. And this is Article 321. So there's nothing really concrete there. And then the most um, worrying thing from a point of view of legal certainty and, and generally where the energy industry is that the whole of the chapter on energy could fall away by 2026. Basically, it says that unless the parties agree to extend it, the deal ends. So we have this kind of a cliff edge moment. Um, and as, as Philip was saying, there was hope that the Windsor framework on Northern Ireland would be the beginning of some more concrete discussions, in particularly in terms of energy. And obviously the most important, and this is where I'll hand over to Silke, is the whole idea of energy trading and in particular, and we'll talk about it more about the sort of the interconnectors and the importance the interconnectors are to play for both sides, but particularly for the UK in terms of achieving its decarbonization and other targets. And yet it's exactly the energy trading and the day-to-day -day trading, which is actually not working and the costs, I'll, I'll hand over to Silke to give us the context of, of why interconnectors um, are an issue, but just sort of a, to get a sense of the importance of interconnectors from a UK point of view, from the point of view of achieving the energy transition and decarbonization targets, National Grid and, and the white paper of the UK government in, envisages a tripling of interconnectors by 2030. Um, and that's just an incredible target to achieve, um, especially as Silke will now explain what the problems are. Silke. <laughs> Thank you, Philip and Nano. Um, the TCA really what it does, it sort of it preserves the the essence of liberalization sometimes. So there is the essence of the idea of third party access, the essence of unbundling. And then sort of it becomes very fluffy and sort of says, well, there's sort of certain best practices, including in relation to interconnectors. So for instance, the parties will work together to consider um, the efficient working of interconnectors or the will in, sort of uh, will work that if in interconnectors are efficient and this is really essential because um from a uk perspective anna has already said off gem the national regulatory authority for the for gb foresees that there should be 18 gigawatt of installed capacity um of interconnectors between the gb and um i'm saying specifically great britain because ireland is unified for the purposes of electricity so this is all about scotland wales and, and england um 18 18 gigawatts plus also um up to depending on average about 10 percent of the electricity in gb comes from the continent likewise in case for instance um the french nuclear fleet has issues then the gb exports into france so and also of course sort of from a from an internal energy market perspective interconnectors have always been at the forefront of integration they've also they have helped the european to achieve the european internal energy market they have helped uh, absorb and balance renewable energy sort of i'm just saying sort of the issues we had between poland and germany for instance for a whole time about sort of where uh inter more interconnectors and, and special technology was needed in order so that the Polish net grid wasn't effectively put into outage by German renewables. And this, I think, will continue because if you consider that um, GB or the UK in this case and the European Union collectively have a target of just under 400 gigawatt of 
renewable energy to be installed, principally either fixed or floating offshore wind in the North Sea, you will need to have a route to market for this offshore wind. The route to market will be interconnectors, will be cables, either sort of so-called point-to-point interconnectors from one jurisdiction to another, or um, from wind farm to wind farm to onshore in, in one or more jurisdictions, so multi-purpose interconnectors. And to have a clear and regulatory regime for those who invest not only in the wind farms, but also into the cables, that is really, really important. And here, the TCA doesn't do very much other than to say, yeah, interconnectors are sort of a good idea. So, for instance, um, the, the TCA foresees that both parties appoint a body to grant exemption from certain types of um, provisions, such as third party access and unbundling, because some of the, the profile of some of the investors is such that such exemptions are necessary. Um, on the UK side, this is off gem. On the EU side, we don't know. So it says the parties, so there could conceivably be, it could either be the European Commission, arguably, the European Commission has currently a role in intra EU exemption. It could be ASA a sort of the European Agency for Energy Regulation, or it could be national NRAs, but that's absolutely, that is really not clear. And it seems that neither the EU nor the UK really have a lot of motivation to go to implement the TCA. But in order to achieve all of these lofty targets in relation to uh, offshore wind, to in order uh, or on the UK side, the, the 18 gigawatt of installed um, interconnector capacity, legal certainty and a clear regulatory framework to encourage investment are really necessary. And for that, it needs some sort of political oomph and will um, behind it. And I'm not sure that I see that even in relation to the implementation, what there is in the TCA, let alone what goes beyond. It's quite ironic, really, isn't it? I mean, there was a period between 2010 and 2015 where the UK government at the time were hesitant about interconnections. Uh, they, they didn't want to commit themselves to it. They promoted something called the Northern Seas Initiative in order to... Um, because they, they really wanted a framework in which everyone would cooperate and possibly invest together in renewables and in interconnection, but they were hesitant about the common rules which are necessary to operate these systems. And the, now we have a commitment to, to for the, on the UK side to go forward with interconnection, but... <laughs> The same preconditions apply. If you want to operate interconnectors, you've got to have at least bilateral rules, if not um, uh, common rules among uh, a, a multilateral rules among a number of uh, players. And it's quite difficult to see how uh, an EU member state could enter into a bilateral arrangement with the with the UK without it having uh, some kind of premature of uh, of uh, approval by um, the eu institutions i personally i think that the answer to your question is not either the commission or acer or national regulatory authorities the the way in which in a complicated way the european union does these things probably all three are necessary that, that would be great as long as they're designated as such. So it yeah. almost doesn't matter which authority takes that role, but as long as sort of there's a clear signal to the market, this is the this is the institution that is responsible. And this goes to the point that Anna made early on as well. And I think Philip, it came through in your introduction, yeah. legal certainty. What the TCA has effectively done from the perspective of the energy market is to introduce a huge amount of uncertainty or um, sort of vagueness in some yeah. sort of, if you reduce the acquis communautaire, which in the energy sector is quite considerable, and if you look at the amount of detail that goes into European directives, regulation, and indeed network codes, and then you kind of boil that down to 12 pages, something will be lost. And I think sort yeah. of we're looking at sort of what has been lost here and um, how to rescue what, what is rescuable. 
maybe maybe just one thing just for the audience that are not energy specialists just to explain why we are emphasizing interconnectors as the sort of the reason you know the sort of the bell wellwind for what's going on is that really if you have um, energy markets or energy sectors that are driven by renewables, where the renewables increasingly are a proportion of the of the of the energy supply, then you need the interconnectors as a balancing source because it actually is able to move the excess um, re re renewables generated from the different markets. So the inter interoperability becomes key. And if we broaden this in within the context of the fact that obviously Switzerland as another third country, which is also as now the UK being outside that market, we see that the issue of interconnectors and also this kind of a separation uh, between the markets is also becomes relevant from not just from the UK point of view, but also from the EU's point of view. And uh, one of the things that we've done in the book is actually to look at and invite Christ uh, John Christoph Fueg, uh, the former uh, the, or the current head of the um, the Swiss Energy uh, Agency in Switzerland to give us an, an an overview of what the situation is in Switzerland and what we can learn from that. And really, sort of as part of the conclusions that Silk and I have made, is that pragmatism will need to become part of the discussions between the EU and the UK and the EU and Switzerland. Switzerland is looking to relaunch its, its uh, negotiations with the EU later this year, um, precisely because in order for all of them to try to reach their targets, whether it's the renewables targets, whether they're the wind, wind um, energy targets or, or generally climate change targets, they cannot actually do it without each other, in, at least in terms of allowing the markets to operate. And, and this is where this, this challenge is uh, really. And obviously Brexit has made that complicated, um, which is the key sort of thing in yeah. the book. I, one one uh, thing thrown up by the comparison with Switzerland is, is uh, that originally the Swiss uh, um, had have, had attempted, and the EU was prepared to do it, to sign incremental agreements in specific areas, which together created a certain critical mass of cooperation between the two bloc between Switzerland and the EU. Uh, since the beginning of the year two thousands, the EU countries have got a little bit fed up with that approach <laughs> by Switzerland and said no. We need to have institutional agreement. We need to have your agreement, for example, that in certain cases, the European Court of Justice is responsible for judging, interpreting EU law and applying it in certain areas. Now, that married with the, the UK approach, which is to leap on board that bus, <laughs> to take another metaphor rather than a ship, uh, and say, Yes, we we have the same attitude. Um, uh, underlines this contradiction that if you if you want to do something together, and I think your conclusions in the book go in the direction of saying there is an opportunity there to do something on a pragmatic basis, then you've got to tackle this institutional blockage, both in Switzerland and in the UK. Now. That blockage still remains in Switzerland, as we've seen from even the last uh, 10 days. Um, and we'll, we'll see uh, to what extent the, the pressures on both of those, uh, both the UK and Switzerland, lead to some recognition of pragmatism. I mean, if you listen to UK ministers uh, seven or eight years ago, they were all saying, well, we don't, we're not worried about Russia because we only, we only use 2%. Uh, we only import two percent of Russian of Russian gas. Uh, since the creation of the gradual um, stabilization of a European wide energy market, the idea that there's that you can actually judge how much Russian gas is in the pipes is very, very is is a bit. It, of an illusion. Um, and since the, uh, because we're going to speak about the Ukraine as well, um, 
since uh, uh, not just the Ukraine, but the market for LNG has become global um, with a lot more demand from uh, Asia than previously, um, the UK is just as much affected as the European Union by the uh, the gradual increase in the price of gas, and indeed the um, and uh, the the the, um, the pressure which the Ukrainian situation has put on on uh, power supplies uh, and gas gas supplies in particular in Europe. So we. <laughs> It's not a perfect storm as yet, but we've got a set of factors here which might drive the UK and the EU closer together. Um, it, it is uh, something which is quite interesting in the way in which the European Union has approached the energy uh, situation. As far as the Eastern uh, member states are concerned, there is absolutely no doubt in, of, the, of the correct direction of EU policy, which is stick together, um, create a, 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 a European-wide market, have more interconnections uh, to, to get to the result, which is good for security, good for prices, uh, and good for, in the end, the climate change objectives. And now, uh, are we going to have uh, a similar reaction in, in the UK. I think, again, we come back to the institutional point. <laughs> uh, uh, are we going to have a discussion each time, as we do with the Swiss, about who is responsible for what in terms of the legal framework, rather than getting on with the actual uh, business of, uh, of, of, of achieving the objectives which we've got? So. Um, I think we've raised a number of issues. Uh, we've probably talked already far too much, so we'd very much uh, appreciate any kind of comments or or questions uh, from from uh, those who are with us today or those who are on screen with us as well. Maybe Fabian, Eric, you'd like to comment too, Fabian? One of the, uh, this is Eric White, um, one of the authors of this uh, of this book. Um, one of the questions I, I would have is, uh, do you see, could you comment on the possibility for the European Energy Charter to fill the gap, um, which has been left from the exit of, um, of uh, the European law from energy cooperation between the UK and the EU? Um, we know that the, the UK is a member of the uh, Energy Charter, is a contracting party still, uh, and um, we know that the EU is uh, looking askance at the Energy Charter because of the investor protection provisions, but it is still there. Is there any scope for and then more cooperation within that framework, which is somewhat looser than used to exist with the EU? Want to comment? Uh, well, I mean, I think, well, Marat is here as the former um, uh, employee of Energy Charter um, Secretary, Treaty Secretariat. But just as a, I mean, the, the kind of um, issues that we have um, highlighted in the book, which are the challenges, um, wouldn't be addressed by the Energy Charter Treaty or aren't addressed by the Energy Charter Treaty. It's not really a treaty that deals with the kind of issues that we're needing to overcome, for example, with respect to intraday trading and, and everything else. Um, and it's it again, it in itself doesn't deal with any kind of regulatory alignment in terms of energy. It's, it really is a treaty to promote investment. And so therefore it doesn't deal with these issues. Um, and in any way, any, any way, the EU is adamant that it's leaving um, in fact, the number of states have already with sort of find, um, submitted their withdrawals, including Germany, Slovenia, the Luxembourg, and so on. So they're on their way out of that. Whether they then sign the modernized version, I also doubt it. 
uh, even though it would be beneficial to them, if nothing else, because the sunset clause would be shortened in terms of investment protection. But I think, I think that 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 boat has sailed. Jessica, um, I like the idea of, a, of sort of a corporation which is perhaps outside the European Union framework, which enables the the UK to come back in and closer to the UK. I'm not sure the Energy Charter is necessarily that forum, but I can imagine that the North Sea Energy Corporation could have that role in, in, in a certain way, because it is a fairly fluffy organization. It's not an official EU institution, yet it has European, is very strongly dominated by the European Union. And there's an immediate common po point of interest, which, which is the development of the North Sea, because um, the, the parties here have something in common, which they could develop, because by and large, the TCA is only there to manage divergence which is perhaps also the difference between, between to the Swiss situation, where the Swiss are seeking to do something more closely together with the EU and vice versa. Um, ultimately, I think that any sort of cooperation framework will be predicated on the political will. Brexit was very clearly a political project. It doesn't mean, therefore, that it makes economic sense or legal sense in, in, in that sense. Um, and I hope perhaps that if that something like the North Sea Energy uh, Corporation can give a um, a light touch framework which uh, helps the parties formulate a common project yeah another a new framework as you implied by your question is is one way out of this but Marek give, give, give us your view about ECT Philip thank you very much and uh well in many ways in many ways that question is very relevant um because uh we have absolutely no indication at the moment of uh UK intention of withdrawing from the Energy Charter Treaty, um, as far as I understand. I'm sure there are discussions within the UK. I've seen some op-eds uh, in the Financial Times from former UK uh, senior energy officials in the government arguing for uh, withdrawal of the UK, uh, but we have not. So, uh, but I think the key point here is that we're talking about two slightly different things when we talk about Brexit and the implications on this whole EU energy sort of relationship with many of the issues that Philip actually raised. You know, I mean, a lot of the uh, sort of technical issues as well as the legal issues. Uh, energy Charter uh, Treaty, not the European Energy Charter. European Energy Charter is a, a political declaration from uh, the early 1990s. But but the Energy Charter Treaty, which is still a legally binding uh, international investment protection tool applicable to the energy sector uh, is still out there. Uh, but the main problem we have with this whole discussion about the Energy Charter today is its applicability and enforcement. Applicability and enforcement. We, we do not, investors uh, do not have a clear sort of understanding uh, to what degree the treaty is enforceable of their investor rights. Uh, and to what degree it is applicable and in which countries, because we know at the moment that Germany uh, and Poland and France have notified of their withdrawal uh, of the Energy Charter Treaty, so they will not be uh, bound by the treaty, uh, you know, uh, sort of immediately in the foreseeable future. They, in principle, will still be bound by the treaty sunset clause. Uh, for another for a period of another 20 years. But from what I'm aware, there's discussions within the EU uh, member states to actually uh, negotiate a separate agreement to nullify the sunset clause. We, we don't have clear information on that. But, uh, but again, it comes down to applicability and enforcement. If there's discussions between member countries to a particular international agreement about changing the terms of the agreement, then that's, uh, you know, uh, basically makes things not very clear from an investor's perspective. Uh, additionally, I think, you know, uh, we should understand that the Energy Charter Treaty, it was invented to uh, protect uh, investments uh, in upstream, but not only in upstream sector, also all types of infrastructure. It can be renewable energy infrastructure, it can be, you know, solar, wind uh, projects. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, fossil fuels as is as has been made out in the media in Brussels uh, over the past few years, that's not very accurate. But, but the treaty, in principle, uh, is an investment protection tool. Uh, if it would work properly, it would work. In principle, it, it would work fine, uh, because 
uh, new countries that would uh, accede to the treaty would actually be bound uh, and then investors would be protected. Yeah? So it is, a, it is a positive instrument for trade uh, and uh, investment in the energy sector. But because of countries' signals and major countries of withdrawal, uh, there is lack of clarity on enforcement and applicability. You see, so uh, that's really, I think, where the discussion is at the moment. There could be a few more things said, but I'll yeah, uh, pause there. Very good. We're in, we're in search of a wider framework, as Eric's pointing to. But Fabian, do you want to say anything else? Where is he? No. Fine. Oh, he's on the line, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, Sitka has pointed out that um, we have an opportunity there in the North Sea. I lived through uh, eight years of discussions of the Northern Seas Initiative. Uh, there again, people think that Brexit was a cutoff point, but there are plenty of people in the UK who didn't want EU rules <laughs> to to govern uh, the initiatives in the North Sea, uh, which is a something that's a re reality. I'm not talking about politicians, but about the practitioners. A, a significant minority of the practitioners did not want um, what they saw as inevitable, that if you have a, a, a group of countries of, of whom the majority are EU, <laughs> then the, the the, the regulations and the codes will tend to look like EU regulations and network codes. That's inevitable. inevitability. Maybe just, maybe just one thing. I mean, there are, there is discussions and there are calls uh, by um, mem EU member states, um, particularly states like the Netherlands and others who obviously have strong bilateral relations and um, with the UK to find ways in to include the UK in different things. So, you know, there's talk of how to involve them in the gas coordination group and so on. But all of these would require some sort of a, at least um, a directive or regulation or something that would provide for that observer status for the UK to have from the point of view of EU law. So you can't just invite them to be observers. There has to be provision in some EU document that provides for that. And I think the fact of the matter that we have yet to see really any even movement on the horizon and discussions, and that's about R&D, research and development. You would think that if they could reach an agreement most easily on something like that, where there's a common interest to co collaborate, because actually the expertise of the UK in certain aspects of the energy sector are, are, are greater, and and in on the other hand, in the other side, there's uh, great expertise at the EU. So this kind of collaboration is of direct interest, and yet, yet it's quite clear that we're not going to have any deal before the recess now, since the UK has just extended. Um, the period of horizon exemptions uh, for is for its researchers for until September in the hope that by September there will be an agreement. But there is also no agreement with Switzerland on horizon. So you can see that that we are really uh, struggling. And I think I think one of the things that has really struck me um, when we've talked about this um, earlier or uh, end of last week, the three of us um, that Silke really emphasized was the fact that the the industry is completely frustrated by the lack of um, lack of clarity, and and just as a as an indicator of how difficult the things are, you know, Aquin, which I think Silka has represented, um, you know, has found itself in a in a situation where it certainly wouldn't have been if we weren't in a Brexit situation, in the sense that the European Court has found that France didn't have to give a reason for not supporting that project as a project of common interest, um, because there's no obligation to give reasons as part of that. But obviously, had the UK been part of the EU, then of course, it would have been part of the discussions that would be sitting around the table when the PCA list would have been been put together and would have insisted on there being reasons and in fact probably would have prevented any kind of blockage and it's the fact that it's not at the table 
that is the problem. And so, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's what on that. Can, I think sort of uh, perhaps Aquint is one of the uh, one interconnector who um, and which is sort of symbolic for that. But interconnection really matters. It was at the height of the energy price crisis that I think it was the new statesman in the UK who said proximity suddenly matters. And that is in relation to um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and sort of the sort of coordination within the European Union and beyond and being sort of a, a ship cut loose from the European Union to come back to your original um, uh, sort of metaphor, Philip, is perhaps sort of the, the strongest sort of uh, statement here that how that is perhaps not a fantastic idea from an energy security perspective and compare and contrast with two things in relation to Ukraine when Ukraine was interconnected with the UCTA, with the, um, the the Western and Central European electricity system, that was sort of like seen as a great symbol and sort of it was electric electricity interconnectors who helped achieve that and who signaled that if we have a common project, common European project, our energy is common, sort of is a common project as well. And I think that was very strong. Um, so um, I'd like to end it there. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> there are obviously several areas of, uh, well, not, possible potential hope um we think that there could be something done in the future in research we think there could be something done on renewables maybe um in terms of the specific or specific new technologies hydrogen and ccus are areas one would expect one would expect there to be uh exchanges um, at least of best practice um but um we're still stuck in the in the uh, in the in the rut of of uh, institutional uh, issues let's uh, widen the discussion a bit to other questions yeah uh, excuse me. Uh, nick powell from a reporter um Anna mentioned how the sector would be left feeling that the, uh, the in the TCA they were something of an afterthought. I've been struggling to try and think of any sector that's not complaining. It was left. It was it was an afterthought. As we as we now know from people who are in the room, the, the last few months of the negotiation were largely about throwing stuff out, and making you know, getting rid of uh, agreement, uh, largely driven by a British belief that uh, pragmatism would sort of resolve everything. Um, I'm thinking slightly, and this obviously is a bit of a tangent, but in the, um, what's going on now with, um, the not unrelated, uh, uh, question of, uh, batteries for electric cars, where we're heading for a cliff edge, that what we're discovering is actually by being outside the EU, Britain is finding itself having to uh it, 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 things have to be agreed things have to be written down leaving it to pragmatism if anything is actually proving harder than you know within the eu when as you was you were mentioning a moment ago you know you were you were in you were in the room where sat around the table in the uh in the council building and uh you know could actually push a pragmatic solution to an issue like oh dear we agreed to resolve this by the end of this year and actually we need another couple of years or whatever yeah. so are we heading for a situation where for force there's going to have to be a lot more written agreement which i guess does sound a little bit like that eu swiss situation which i know in principle the eu would like to move away from yeah i mean just to give a personal response first of all that i mean there's pragmatism in the sense in the uk sense of we're prepared to do anything as long as it doesn't uh, uh, tread on the institutional red lines, which we've referred to earlier. Um, however, virtually, virtually all the pragmatic agreements we can think of, I think in this room, require some kind of agreement on common rules, which as you say, have to be written down. So um, even, even the most pragmatic of, of minds uh in this present context has to think about a text which is acceptable to both sides and i i'm i'm a bit skeptical as to whether we can find it for the moment well i i think 
I mean, pragmatism, as, as you've both said, is a, a UK kind of position, but it's certainly not an EU position. Pragmatism hasn't been a UK EU approach to anything. It's actually primarily based on ideology. And I would suggest that the two positions are being entrenched. I don't see the EU becoming more pragmatic. I, become, I see it as becoming more entrenched in its position. So I, I would call for the EU as, a, as wearing the two hats, a UK and, and an EU hat, um, to be more pragmatic, because I think it is in our best interest to do so, but it would require a significant shift. And just so that it, I don't think that we get the impression that only the UK is at a loss as a result of Brexit, I think I think we have emphasized in the book in the numbers of ways in which the EU is at a loss. And I think energy security is a key aspect of that. But there is there are there are many more aspects of that. But even just the way in which the debate is now taking place in the field of energy within the EU out without the UK means that countries like the Dutch and others are left very much on their own in terms of promoting a liberalized energy market. So that the, the voices and the in the way in the which the politics of energy politics and many other things are now being shaped in the EU as a result of the UK leaving has changed. And I wouldn't say it's for the better. So I think, you know, the ramifications are, are on both sides. Um, same but different, I would say, sort of I come slightly from from not quite the opposite, but sort of I share the idea that you sort of pragmatism is definitely sort of a UK approach to life. However, the pragmatism always, and that, that's the lawyer in me and the EU law trained lawyer in me, it needs to be rule based. And um, so whilst the EU might wish to consider being a bit pragmatic in, for instance, for instance, when it comes to agreeing interconnectors in, in the North Sea or MPIs, the UK, I think, will need to get used to the idea that it is not in the room of making the rules and that rules ne are, ne are needed in order to frame a common relationship. So there is a little bit of, um, of rapprochement that is required. Um, the My impression is in, um, Anna said ideology, that sort of definitely Brexit was ideology based. It was sort of this fantasy of sort of a pure national sovereignty over everything and um, Actually, sort of looking back at the last few years, sovereignty in particular in the energy sector is always only shared because um, largely the European energy markets are trying to distribute something competitively that is not necessarily generated inside the European Union or less and less generated in the UK as well, gas. And they're generating together and building together an ele electricity market and i think sort of the combination of clear rules legal certainty but pragmatism in the pragmatism in the application of those rules seems to me for me to be the the, the way ahead yeah it's, i mean the the european union could offer some degree of pragmatism by flexing its um uh by being more flexible at the margins of uh, respecting EU-wide regulations and rules, the 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 challenge is, would be to ensure that the degree of pragmatism which the UK is prepared to put on the table is more or less at the same level, and that that's um, that's. Uh, Maybe, as, as, as Silke and Anna have already said, that maybe we'll be able to come, overcome that in the context of specific sectoral agreements, uh, which has not been possible in, in, with Switzerland <laughs> precisely because neither, of, neither side was willing to be that pragmatic. The Swiss never liked any mention of... Um, of the commission obviously <laughs> um but even less mention of the ecj um whereas the european union ourselves at that time were saying well okay uh if you don't like the commission would you accept the efta surveillance authority as a as a way of dealing with it and the efta courts uh answer no <laughs> on the swiss side so um um Maybe it's a question of the, the 
pressure which is exerted by the benefits, the value added of the agreement, which will eventually get us over the over the cliff, over <laughs> prevent us from falling off the cliff or, or whatever. I think that the that the EU and the UK being separate when facing all these technological challenges, which of these technologies is going to work for climate change? Um, by, by implementing Brexit as it is now being implemented, uh, both sides are, are narrowing down the alternatives for themselves. <laughs> Um, and narrowing and, and increasing the degree of risk that, uh, from the point of view of security, uh, things uh, uh, could be taken to the wall. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, I mean, you read it in the in in the book here that there's a, there's a a concern, a basic concern of frustration that things which are essential for both sides are not happening. And we need to do something about it. Yeah, I mean, maybe just, oh, there's a question. But maybe just as the mic is traveling there, I uh, don't know where it is. Um, <clears throat> just to say that, and maybe just as a plug to say that we will have a book launch and a discussion on the, on the Swiss implications, in particular in Switzerland, as part of the discussions, um, you know, in the preparations of the Swiss government, um, rapprochement with the, with the, with the EU later this year and hopefully in Norway, which we haven't touched upon here. And, um, but it's also struggling as a result of not being at the table and yet the rules and a different situation and the rules applying to it. Um, and just sort of an indication of the fact that in, in this, in the Swiss situation, in terms of the interconnectors and interoperability, things have been going backwards in the sense that there was more integration of the Trans this transmission system operators before because they were governed by direct treaties and, and contracts between the TSOs, which the EU has insisted on unwinding as a result of there not being an institutional framework. So you can see that things could actually get worse especially as we mentioned that, that the energy provisions of the TCA could fall away by the 30th of June, 2026. So unless there's a concerted effort between now and 2026, and I would say much earlier than that, we actually have a situation where the energy companies are in an even more uncertain situation because they actually don't know what rules are going to apply. And yet you need to know what the rules are um, in a sort of a, at least the medium term in order to plan anything. So here we are in this challenging uh, situation in energy transition, and yet we don't know what rules are going to be in place. And so- Mary, sorry. Yes, if I might ask you another question, a somewhat speculative question. Um, it, it has been mentioned that the, the whole energy chapter would expire in 2026. One wonders why, when you negotiate an agreement for cooperation, it should be long term, you put sunset clauses into agreements. Uh, and there are several sunset clauses in the um, trade and cooperation agreement, and we would like it to interfere with each other. But if you could just speculate for a moment, if um, we go forward to 2026 um, and nothing has happened to implement the energy charter, uh, sorry, the, the energy provisions of the TCA and, um, the, and there's no new agreement, which was with longer uh, time frame, um, what, what, what do you foresee happening? Because you can see it happening in both uh, directions, both parties saying, well, since we've not managed to agree so far, um, we'd better prolong the little bit of um, rules that we have longer so that in, in, and, and try a little bit longer to, to reach an agreement. Or one could, uh, of course, see one of the parties saying, well, in order to force matters to a conclusion, I'm not going to agree to a renewal of the energy chapter. Well, just let it expire. Um, you, the other side, you've not done anything so far, so just let it expire. And then all of a sudden, perhaps you'll get some, some, some activity, uh, some last minute negotiation of, of rules, which will be of lasting significance. So if I may ask you to speculate, what do you see happening in 2026 if we carry on as we have done so far? 
that's I mean you talk about also on the one hand about the substance of it and also about the tactics of how do you get to a situation where everyone agrees by the way I was thinking before we answer your question Harry, that that um uh in relation to observer status given to to Norway um it, it was relatively easy to do from a from in terms of adaptation of 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 rules i think we started off with a memorandum of mentioning it in a memorandum of understanding and then it was reflected in the in in ensui and in the, the statutes of ensui and ensui g i don't recall that we did we had to change the third package regulations in order to achieve it um so I, I think really it's a question of whether both sides uh are, are, are happy to do it uh and i think that the, in the norwegian case uh, i remember my predecessor as director general was against norway uh, having observer status because uh, he said well they don't they don't they won't want to be subject to uh, the totality of our rules and i said well basically they may not be subject want to be subject to the totality of the rules but they are already de facto inside the european energy uh, market and therefore we should we should uh, encourage that now, now to come back to Eric's <laughs> question i mean uh, speculate a bit uh, well, I don't know. I mean, all I can say is that um, with all the all the agreements we've had so far between them, whether it's the withdrawal agreement or the TCA, everything was a bluff till the end, and then a, a rush to agree something just before the the deadline, or even extending the deadlines when you haven't got an agreement. So, my fear is that it'll be the latter uh, scenario that you you've said, um, unless there's pressure, significant pressure from industry um to to make to avoid that but um i mean the book certainly calls for for per, first of all a depolitization of energy um on both in the uk and the eu um um and uh, and 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 an attempt to try to you know reach an agreement and a concrete one um for for um to to replace the cliff edge but yeah I have a feeling that it will just be rolled over, sort of for, for better or for worse. If I look at how the negotiations for the multi-region low volume coupling, um, Philip, your favorite abbreviation. Uh, so basically the, the very technical arrangements as to how exactly electricity can be traded over interconnectors between the UK and, uh, and the EU. The TCA says the parties should get together and define this mechanism called multi-region low vol volume coupling. Um, okay, so my understanding is the TSOs have gotten together, they have done some studies, there was, uh, ASA had published a, a study in a couple of years ago, there were some responses to that, and most recently, I think in February of this year, the Specialised Committee on Energy said, oh, we need some more information in order to progress, so they called upon the TSOs in order to do some more information exchange, so that it had this very classical sort of, I call on somebody else to do something in the hope that it was incredibly diplomatic language, which effectively sort of prolonged the entire process, so I'm not very optimistic that in particular this, these trading arrangements will be put in place before 2026, and that ultimately it will be kicked sort of slightly further down the road uh with an extension or something like that. That, that that's my personal speculation um anything which is called multi-regional loose volume coupling doesn't sound as if it's going to be the subject of any major breakthrough <laughs> in agreement between between the eu and the uk i i mean isn't isn't the real speculation eric in your question that uh, maybe if one thinks about a wider framework than simple EU law and UK law, a, a wider framework of an agreement, uh, whether or not the chapter, the energy part of the TCA is rolled over or not, 
uh, if there's going to be any breakthrough, it'll be in some framework which gives both sides the idea that they are moving forward, but they're not constrained by their positions over the TCA. Uh, any other uh, remarks, questions, comments? Uh, is there anyone online who might want to say something? Marit. Um, just a couple of things I want to contextualize and maybe throw out a little bit into the audience. So, I mean, uh, today's discussion is really uh, about, you know, rules, regulations, laws about Britain, UK, uh, rather, and the European Union. Uh, but I'm just trying to think from a practical perspective, um, you know, beyond the politics, beyond the debates about how... Uh, rules let's say will apply and in the long term but but uh, for all three of you and people also in the audience i mean what are the key changes that you've actually seen uh, in the actual trade and investment trends both relating to eu uk trade and investment and of course one should be reminded that you know the uk and uh, the eu does not have a relationship in terms of the economic side, not the political side that the EU has with, let's say, you know, energy supplies like Russia or um, you know Norway or Algeria. Uh, but uh, what what uh, let's say uh, differences or impact or or trends have we seen since Brexit became a reality? in the context of trade and investment trends in energy in the UK, uh, and then in the EU, which we may not have seen if Brexit would not have happened. Maybe just think a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a counterfactual there, which may, may or not, may not be verifiable. Go ahead. The counterfactual is hard to do, but just sort of what I see in, in general terms in my daily practice. So first of all, we've mentioned the interconnectors. It is much harder sort of there's been additional obstacles in order to build, agree and sort of construct them. First of all, the regulatory status in some member states is harder. Then, but sort of more from a consumer perspective, the fact that, and this is, apologies, I'm getting slightly technical on volume coupling and price coupling. So electricity is traded across the entire European Union, or almost the entire European Union, on a, on a price coupled basis. So meaning that electricity flows through to the highest area with the, the area with the highest price. You don't need to book interconnector capacity, you just trade. In theory, you can sit in northern Denmark and basically get electricity from <laughs> a solar farm in somewhere in Portugal by contract, and it will just sort of travel automatically. You can't do that any longer between GB and Europe. You first need to go and book interconnector capacity. Then you go and book the energy. And basically it has fallen, it has kicked back the trading arrangements to how they were pre-2014, except for, well, that worked in 2014, except for the entire rest of the European Union has moved on. And this inefficiency, if, if, you, if you look at what EFED, the, the European Federation of Energy Traders, is also saying on that topic, um, basically it has added hundreds of millions to the price of electricity collectively over that time. And um, be, uh, I think Ma uh, Matthew Hind from National Grid in, in a hearing of the House of Lords was uh, putting that figure out. Um, EFED has confirmed that electricity trading is much more ineffect ineffective uh, um, now. Uh, between the two jurisdictions sort of I also see uh, clients uh, energy invest investors in the energy sector who say we have a mandate to only invest in the European Union so sadly we can't invest in the UK I mean the UK lots of stuff is happening in the UK energy sector uh, exciting things as well in terms of new business models and uh, etc but the dynamic and the sort of there are certain types of investors who will not invest in pound sterling uh, or, the, or the UK because precisely because the European Union is no, no longer there. Well, I think the other thing, and just taking it more broadly, I mean, labor shortages, um, uh, increasing costs of just pro products um, generally across the board, 
we've seen that happen. And I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, the government in the UK has, has avoided marking the seventh anniversary of the referendum, which we just had on the 29th of June. So um, without any mention of it actually having happened. Um, um, but there's no doubt that even if you take away the COVID as a as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a reason for labor shortages. No, there's no doubt that, that Brexit has contributed significantly to that. And obviously access to R&D, um, uh, funding, all of those things are, are, are crucial impacts on the energy sector in specifically. So, so whether, you know, whether you're going to be developing wind farms or nuclear energy access to the la labor um, is, 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 is a key issue now. Uh, for, for both sides, because actually what the flexibility that you had when you didn't have to have visas was that you were moving um, uh, qualified uh, people from one project to the other without, you know, seamlessly. And that is not going to be able to happen. And obviously that in itself will uh, give a rise to greater costs for energy companies on both sides involved in these projects. And and in fact, they are all present. I mean, EDF is is the you know is, is extremely present in the UK market, not least in the nuclear industry. So it is directly affected as a French company um, in as a result of Brexit. And there's just one example of a, a company. Yeah, and just adding to that as uh, as you know, what would ha have happened if Brexit had not happened? The surely the the reality that some of the major changes which have occurred in the gas market and the electricity market, the urgency of uh, making our uh, climate change uh, objectives more ambitious, um, those the reflections on how to do that and how to adapt to to the changes in in global markets uh ha is is happening independently of each other and uh i'm i'm absolutely certain that the range of solutions and alternatives would have been greater for both sides if uh, if there was um um if there if if there w had been an agreement for energy cooperation to continue in some form or other now I'm I'm not as optimistic as Anna is about whether you can depoliticize energy entirely because energy on things like security of supply it's a, it's a very sensitive topic on the price is a very sensitive topic um and um unfortunately most of the political reaction to what's happening in the energy energy sector are, are, is to leap on simple solutions in terms of regulating or or or, or restricting uh, whereas what is rather positive about what's happened with the european energy market despite some some backtracking by some member states is that everyone is basically saying yes the idea of uh, of a single energy market is across Europe is a good thing um, from the point of view of competitive prices, from the point of view of security of supply, and and, um, and also from the point of view of um, of creating a, a framework in which climate change can be uh, can be successfully managed. And uh, I think that. Um, uh, a few of my colleagues in, in London who disagree with the idea that your, your your energy policy needs to have those three aspects to it: competitive, security of supply, uh, climate change uh, friendly, and that it is in principle a good thing to do it with your neighbours. But that's the counterfactual uh, politically, which is most important, as well as the practical disadvantages of for the UK in particular uh, but also for the EU in not uh, not uh, staying under the same framework uh now I think we've uh, but just one one last question and then we'll last comment or question and then we'll uh, 
we'll wrap up. Uh, good afternoon, Franz Bogic is my name. I'm a member of European Parliament from Slovenia. I yeah. know Anna very well, so she invited me here. And thanks for a great discussion, which was very interesting. I'm not an energy exp expert, but as you said, uh, Sir Philip, I also agree with you that uh, the depolitization of energy is not uh, in Europe now, as, as I see this situation. And uh, in these years after uh, referendum, after Brexit, uh, we had many of these game changers uh, and uh, COVID crisis mm. made a new situation. The, the war in Ukraine especially made a new situation. And in Europe, we are on the, this track of uh, Green Deal. And uh, we know that uh, the mandate of Commission of Parliament is one year, one year more. And now it's big pressure to work on these files on uh, on Green Deal. And there are also a lot of a lot of questions. If everything is OK, is we were too ambitious, we uh, too politic too, too much politicization in the in the policy in this energy sector. And here I come to discussion about nuclear energy in Europe, which is all the time big discussion. Then we come to the colors of of hydrogen. And again, behind this again, politics and interests, not only politics, because energy, politics, interests, it's things which can't, goes together. So I think, and I'm afraid that uh, in 2026, uh, in Europe, we will have a lot of debate what we did in this legislature till the begin till the end of this mandate then the new commission start and there will one i am as i see situation there will be a reality check is everything is okay in 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 this topics uh, uh, what we did and if i may ask you how is the view on uh, this all green deal package renewable everything what we have about this you know this better than me and what is the view from the great britain is now that uh, the brits said thanks god that we are not in you because uh, it's not <laughs> easy to follow this old legislation or it will it, there is opportunity for new cooperation or there will be more obstacles for cooperation yeah how you see this well, you, topics? a lot of what you said is wise words but on the last question i'm going to ask Silke. Just you, I think sort of the Green Deal is being followed with great interest and is also seen as a direct competitor to IRA in the US. So the energy sector is not only European, it's global. And uh, so how Europe, how Europe is getting competitive in relation to the energy transition and uh, green energy is seen with great interest. Um, Britain was actually, or the UK was actually one of the first jurisdictions in the world to legislate for net zero by 2050 yeah. in the climate change, in the Climate Act. So Politically, there is a great commitment, and I think that's probably true across all party political colours in the UK, that uh, there should be a form of Green Deal. Um, coming back to what uh, Philip and Anna have said before, the the type, the way that that is organised is probably slightly different in Britain. It's very strongly market-based, very strongly sort of, um, rather than sort of um, by government incentives or, or rules, so the sort of the, the debate, sort of the slant of the debate, is, is slightly separate. But I think it's still followed with great interest, but not not the least because there's a form of level playing field in the TCA. So neither yeah. party can actually go behind behind what was already agreed. Um, the idea that CBAM might be around um, and the UK sort of it might apply to the UK if the UK doesn't pull along. Um, with those sort of investments or sort of uh, rules in relation to to green energy and, and green investments more generally is very strongly there. So it's followed with in, with great interest, um, not necessarily always by the current government, but uh, it is certainly followed by, by investors with great interest. Well, uh, just maybe just to say that, I mean, just a few days ago, the the Climate Change Committee, which is sort of the UK think tank and um that sort of oversees and comments on on the government's uh, decarbonization and net targets in the UK has actually come uh, made a statement a very important statement which is said it's actually said that it has markedly less confidence in the ability and I'm quoting and of the ability of the UK to reach its goals so we have the same um um difficulties in terms of there is a s political commitment but actually 
devoid of, of, of reality, both in terms of the route of achieving them and also in terms of the timing. Um, so um, a reality check is going to have to be done um, there as well. And when we actually had a successful high court challenge last year, whereby the um, the NGOs um, took the government to court for the failure to have sufficiently clear um, uh, route to how to achieve the targets, and, and the government had to present a new a new um, a new strategy this year. But I the two are in that respect i would say that the ships are sailing in the same direction as philip at the beginning said the, the targets are, are are the same um it's the fact that they're actually not able to even find a way to work on those together which i think will mean that neither will achieve its targets not just because they're not cooperating together but also because of the targets um are, are done in such a way that they don't um, um add up in in the right way but that's another huge debate. Yeah. Listen, um, we've had a very interesting discussion. Um, I hope you realize this this book is um, a very valuable backdrop to any discussion about about uh, Brexit, uh, but also about energy in the UK and energy in the EU and what could be done. It's unfinished business. We could be on the edge of a cliff. Uh, we could alternatively uh be looking for new ways in which we could get over the institutional barriers to further cooperation uh, we have on both sides of the channel uh some fairly strong lobbies from business and from investors to do something and uh i think on that basis um, we should look at on this discussion as about as it says here, not just implications, but also opportunities. And I uh, thank you very much for the attention you've given to us to, today. Thank you. Hello, Silke Goldberg, I'm astonished for this really interesting uh, session today. Uh, to thank the participants for their questions and for their uh, involvement, lively involvement in this seminar.